Okay, good morning, everybody. Give me a nice like to uh, see if you guys can hear me. Okay, we need a like here. Hopefully you guys can hear me. All right, any likes coming in? Remember, got to hear some likes here now. So hopefully you guys can hear. Any likes coming in? Well, we're going to get started anyway. Okay. So we're going to get started anyway, even though you guys don't have any likes coming in. So we'll just assume you guys can hear me now. Um, take a look here. <clears throat> so we're going to get started on what we started to talk about which was a rate of change. Now, what I'll do here is we're going to go back to that secant line. So we're going to find that secant line, ladies and gentlemen. So you say, where's our secant line? Um, not graphing secant. Oh, we're going to have to, arc length and sector. We're going to have to look at this list. Secant and tangent line. Here we go, ladies and gentlemen. So we'll find one of these clean kind of sheets here. And let me first start off with, well, we'll start off way over here. There we go, here's one. Okay, so remember what we know, first of all, this dis distance here, we're gonna put this distance here on the x-axis, right? And I think I do have another there we go. I think I'm going to use this one instead. Okay, so we're going to have here this location known as X1. And then you've got another location, maybe somewhere over here, over here known as X2. Okay, and so the difference here in length, and always remember, whenever you do a length, it's a right value minus a left value. Right, so it's right minus left. So what you're looking at here is for the difference in the x values, we know the delta, x2 minus x1. And then we have the difference in the y values. And you say, well, what are the y values? Well, here, for the first point, that's y1. It looks like here this is going to be y2. So the difference in the y values would be y2 minus y1. And so we measure this thing known as the slope, right? So from beginning to algebra, we know that the slope was delta y over delta x, which is equal to y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Now, this is the slope of that red line, the secant line. Now, this is known, ladies and gentlemen, as a difference quotient. And that's thought of as the change in y over the change in, in x. And I say over, that means divide by the change in the x values. Okay, so, you know, you have in green the change in y right here. And in gray, we'll say here's the change in x values. This is known as a difference quotient. And, you know, geometrically, it's our, the slope of the secant line. So we say, okay, we know this already. You haven't told us anything different. So this concept here, this difference quotient, um, if I start to look at this in terms of calculus, well, this is f of x2 minus, this is f of x1. So we're going to start to look at this. This is what we should say is beginning algebra. And now we've got the calculus flavor, which is f of x2 minus f of x1 over x2 minus x1. Okay, so difference quotient. We're going to use this definition. And then you say, but Mr. Judge, we take that limit here. So if we're going to take this limit, we're going to say, look at x2. 
I'm going to take the limit. We're going to see x2 approach x1. So the values of x2 here are going to get closer and closer and closer to, we're going to approach x1. So what I'm saying here is this. As x2 gets closer to x1, we're going to see how this definition changes. So there's the x2 values. They're going to get closer to x1. And what's going to happen is now we're going to get this m secant becomes m tangent. And then you can say this is the limit as x2 goes to x1 for this difference quotient x2 minus f of x1 over x2 minus x1. So we're looking at what's happening here. Now, here's what I want to also remark for you guys, because this is just notation. So x2 is getting closer to x1, but what's happening here? This difference, ladies and gentlemen, as x2 gets closer to x1, we say delta x goes to 0. So x2, that coordinate is going to get closer to the x1. The x1 is fixed, so we have that delta x. So if I go back to this kind of idea, let's copy this here. So we guys, so we have this. Nope, I want to copy. Let's paste. You say, okay, here's the various ways we could look at this. We know then m tangent can also be described as the limit. of that delta x going to zero of this dis difference quotient here. Okay, so this is a rate of change here. So today I want people to really understand and realize we're going to work with these two concepts here and I'm going to put this, you know, in black and, and emphasize the difference, right? The geometric difference. So you have the change in y change in x, but this is actually the limit. And that's kind of what we're dealing with in terms of a rate of change here. So let me start by giving you guys some functions, but I want to copy everything I'm doing here. So let's copy. And I'm going to go into the rate of change note and show you that the geometry here we get these kind of definitions and we're going to start to use these. This is about rates of change here now, right? Because a rate is this quotient. Here's my difference quotient. Well, it's a different quotient. We already wrote that down. It's a rate of change and you have we have two types of rate of change here. So let me give you guys this fact here. We can start talking about the context and the difference. So we have two types. And you say two types, what are they? Well, the first type is I'm going to say you have what's called an average rate of change. Okay, so we have an average rate of change here. And you might say, which one's the average rate of change? Well, I'm going to write this down so you guys know. Think of this as m secant. That's the average rate of change. I'm sorry, it looks like I almost dropped my mouse. You guys don't know what it's like for me here. As I don't know what it's like for you guys there. We have instantaneous 
rate of change. And you say, what's the instantaneous rate of change? Well, m tangent. So you have an average rate of change, and you have instantaneous rate of change. And so for a simple kind of example here, here's kind of what they'll say. It's kind of what you can see. They can say, okay, um, we're going to let, you know, I'll say f of t. Or we'll say f of x, it doesn't matter. Be some function like, um, how about x squared minus the square root of x over an interval um, 0 to 4 here. All right, so you're going to start just with a function. And they're going to say, determine the average rate of change over the interval. And you go, okay, they want an average rate of change over this particular interval. So you might say, I'm going to go back here to what the average rate of change actually is. It's this m secant right over here. And you might say, what are these values, right? x1 and x2. Well, the interval they have here for the average rate of change over an interval here is x1 comma x2. So for the average rate of change, you know, okay, this is going to be over this particular interval. Here's my first value for x. Here's my second value for x. So they have to give you that interval if they want an average rate of change. And, you know, we could write it this way. Average rate of change is really the difference in y over the difference in x. And sometimes they put that line for average. Um, and then you can say, this is, is this really f of x2 minus f of x1 over x2 minus x1? And the answer is yes. So you use the definition here. It's really geometrically the slope of the secant line. And in this case, all we have to do is replace the x1 values and the x2 values right here, 0 and 4. So we can say, Four, zero, four, zero. So you'll have here f of four minus f of zero, everything over four minus zero. And you say, well, what's f? F is right up here. This is my function f, so we get to plug in here for f, 4. So, you can say you have 4 squared minus the square root of 4 minus 0 squared minus the square root of 0 over that 4 minus 0 here. Okay, because you're going to also plug in the value of x being 0. All right, and so you're getting the average rate of change. It's just going to be, notice it comes down to just looking at some algebra and arithmetic. So this is going to be, um, I guess we can say 16 minus 2 minus 0 over 4, and 16 minus 2, this is 14 over 4, which is 7 halves, or we can say, you know, 3.5 either. So the average rate of change over that interval is actually 3.5. Um, and you can say, well, it's a rate. We won't pay attention to units at this point, but this is just a rate. But this is what we call an average rate of change. So you just really have to find, you're just using you know, the slope of the secant line through that curve. It's beginning algebra, ladies and gentlemen. You know, you're looking at the slope, and that's all it is for average rate of change over an interval. And then you know, if you're talking about a limit now, and you say, but Mr. Judge, you just showed me here that the next kind of question, they're going to say, what 
is the instantaneous rate of change. Now this is not in an interval that's going to be at a particular point. Okay, so you go, well, if the interval we started with 0, 4, notice what's really, really happening here, right? x2 is approaching x1, because this is x2, it's 4. So it's going to 0, or the delta x, the difference goes to 0. You know, so this is now m tangent. So if they say, what's the instantaneous rate of change? And this is really the, the essence of the course at that point zero. This is m tangent equals the limit as delta x goes to zero. This is the definition. And you might say to me, but we've learned that this is really the definition of the derivative of the function f at zero. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is calculus. This is the same equivalent definition that we've been working with, and that's kind of one of the reasons why I have you guys work with definitions. Um, you know, it, it's definitions are what makes the world go round. So you might say, if my function they gave me here already was x squared minus the square root of x, all I have to do to find the instantaneous rate of change at the point zero is take the derivative and the answer is yes. Because that's the slope of the tangent at that particular point zero. So, um, you know, and I guess to really give you, I guess I should say, I could leave it this way, right? I should leave it that way. And, um, you know, so we can call that the same thing. If you guys want to do that, x1. And we need the derivative of the function. So to get the derivative of the function, this is why you guys did all that hard work on derivatives, right? Is because we're going to start to use these things. And so the derivative of a difference is difference of derivatives. And know the definition of that square root of x. Here's what you end up with. 2x minus 1 half x to the 1 half minus 1, which is 2x minus 1 half x to the minus 1 half. And we get 2x minus 1 over 2 square root of x. Now, please, did I make a mistake? Yeah, I made a mistake. Ah, horrible. I apologize. I got to change this on you guys. We're not defined at zero, so I apologize here. Let's put one. And that's going to change everything here. So we can find, well, it's going to change our instantaneous. So we'll change that. And I apologize. I hate when people do that. My instructors used to do that. So you guys can appreciate why we got to change it. Let's put that one there. And this value is going to change. Yeah, well, maybe. This is still going to be 0, by the way, ladies and gentlemen. So, but the denominator is going to be 3. Fourteen thirds. And we can just go with that. We'll go with 14 thirds. Apologize. We'll keep the fraction. Average rate of change. Okay. So why you always should really not make things up on the fly. All right. Now we got that derivative. Okay. So here's my f prime x. Okay, and we have to evaluate this at x equals 
that 1 now. So the interval is 1 to 4, right? So let's change this here. This is not going to be at 0. It's going to be at 1. All right. So plug in a 1. Air prime at 1, 2 times 1, minus 1 over 2, square root of 1. 2 minus 1 half, and you guys know the arithmetic here, times 2 over 2. So we get 4 halves minus 1 half, and f prime of 1 is actually 3 halves. So this is the instantaneous rate of change, ladies and gentlemen. Instantaneous rate of change. Whew. All that this morning just to get out these two kinds of definitions. So this is beginning to look at rate of change. So before we go forward, anybody have any questions on this? Any questions? Before we go further on the rates of change here. Any, any questions at all? Let's get our sound out. You guys want some sound here? What do you think? Should get some sound for you guys? Wake you guys up? What do you think? We should wake up. Is that right? wake up? What do you guys think? All right, you guys okay? No questions. Good for you guys. Okay, this is the instantaneous rate of change. That's the derivative. That's why we actually been working with derivatives. So let me kind of switch gears here on you guys and give you some more definitions here. So I'm going to call this here, we're going to say, here's the definition here um, of what we call a position function. And a position function is exactly that, um, but it's going to be a position function on a line. It could be a vertical or horizontal line. Okay, so this is where we start off and we say, let s sub t be the position of a function, okay, at time t. So in other words, and sometimes they'll say s is f of t, or just simply s of t. You know, they'll just say s equals s of t. It doesn't matter. But I have to point out some details, right? So here's one detail. t represents time. s here represents position. So S represents position, right? And T represents time. So we got position and we got time. We got really two variables here, right? S, and I guess we have to do it this way. We have S versus T. Okay, so we got position, S versus time. And you know, so let me give you an example of a position function. It could be any example. Um, I can say, let's do it in blue, I guess. Okay, so we're going to let s of t, here's an example of a position function. Maybe t to the fourth 
minus All right, let's do this one. I'm going to do a different one. How about this? t cubed minus 9t squared plus 5t plus 15t plus 10. Okay, so we have a nice position function. This is an example. And I want you guys to note. Here's what they're going to say. Let's, let's note the following. T is in time. So time, whatever units of time, it could be minutes, seconds, hours, right? Minutes, second, hours. Your position can either be, you know, in centimeters, meters, feet, any sort of unit of distance. So you have units of time and units of distance. So here's my position function. T cubed minus 9T squared plus 15T plus 10. And... Here's what the deal is. They can say, determine the position for various times. And they'll define this. They'll say, your position is in centimeters, and then time could be in seconds. OK? So they haven't given you a question yet. They can say, S of 0, S of 1, S of maybe 4. Now, I want to say to you guys, if you're talking time, time is always greater than or equal to 0. So for position functions, this is always the case. Anybody have any questions on that? You have any questions for, for time? It's always going to be positive or 0. Time is never negative. We don't go back in time. So for every one of these questions here, all you do is plug in the value of t. So if t is 0, you plug in 0, ladies and gentlemen, for t. It's just arithmetic again. So you say s of 0 becomes 0 cubed minus 9 times 0 squared plus 15 times 0 plus 10. So you have s of 0 becomes 0 minus 0 plus 0 plus 10. F of, s of 0 is 10. This is position. You are at the position 10 centimeters. So we found the first position for a particular time. And so that's kind of relevant, ladies and gentlemen, because remember, this is on a real number line. I'm going to draw a horizontal line here. So let me do this horizontal line to let you guys know um, that this is kind of the purpose of it. So if this is a real number line here, right, and we're going to let this be the time axis, the variable is t. So s of 0 is at 10 centimeters, okay? So there's various ways to do this. I'm going to plot that there. And so if I give you another definition here, I want you guys to remember, we have something called the initial position. And that's really by definition, it's s of 0. So my initial position of this particle on that real number line at time 0, we start, this is where you guys start, we start at 10. Remember, 10 is positive and it's to the right, so you're starting there. So we got an initial position, ladies and gentlemen. S of 0. It's definition. And you said, okay, what else did they ask us? Well, they said, you know what? Here's S of 0. We found it. We got S of 1. So we're going to plug in 1 now. We're plugging 1. Plug in the value. 1, 1, 1, and 1. So S of 1 now, the position at time 1, becomes 1 cubed minus 
9 times 1 squared plus 15 times 1 plus 10. So this gives us 1 minus 9 plus 15 plus 10, doing some arithmetic. And so it looks like, um, oh, what, 26 minus 9, we're going to get, right, 26 minus 9, and it looks like that's going to be 17. So my position at one second is actually 17. So in some ways, we can say, well, where is 17 on the real number line? Well, it's further to the right. So, so notice what's happening with this particle and its position, right? We sometimes put here t0, t is 1. The particle looks like it's moving to the right after just one second. So it started at 10, and it looks like it's going in this direction here. Right? Because it's actually further away at 17. So at one second, it's at 17. We have to also look at this initial position here, four seconds. So you say, well, what do I do now? Well, now, instead of plugging in 0 and 1, you're going to plug in a 4. 4, 4, 4. So let's be careful now, ladies and gentlemen. So when we start to do some of these things, s of 4 will be 4 cubed minus 9 times 4 squared plus 15 times 4 plus 10. Okay. And I'm going to go to the TI because... You know, we can do that to some degree. I can do the arithmetic myself, ladies and gentlemen. I can do that. We all can, right? We can do this. But let's try to, um, you know, for the sake of time, we got a lot to cover. You know, there's a lot to cover in a calculus course. All right, we got to do 4 cubed. Okay, 4 raised to the third power. Oh, come on, let's clear that. Okay, 4 raised to the third power, I want to get out of the power position, right? And that's minus 9 times 4 squared, we've got to get out of there, plus 15 times 4, plus 10. We get negative, s of 4 is negative 10. So here's what I want to emphasize to you. At 4 seconds, the particle now is at negative 10. So we have to start to think about this. What has happened? Right? Somehow, what has happened here is that at some location, at some point, this particle is now somewhere over here. It's, it's at a negative position. It's to the left of zero. That happens in T is 4, ladies and gentlemen. So if I kind of look at this, let me put a highlighter. But this is kind of the position. I'm not sure what happens here. It could turn around, or at some future time, it's turned around, and it's now over here at 4 seconds. All right, you guys know what I'm talking about? We're plotting the position on the real number line for various time values, and this is how position functions work. So we're doing the analysis of all this stuff, this rate of change and position functions here. So this is kind of how we start with this, and I want to kind of say we got to dive into the details, so I'm going to have to give you some more definitions so we could get the details. So, okay, let's give you guys some definitions here. So when we're talking about rate of change, you go, Mr. Judge, that's just position. What does the topic of the day have to do with rate of change? Here's the beginning of it. I'm going to give you the definition. Since we're talking S of T, a position function, this is also known as motion of a particle along a line. motion of a particle along the line. 
So the definition of what we call velocity. And velocity we represent with V of t. And V of t is simply ds dt, or the derivative of the position function. Because this here, remember, it's a rate of change. That's going to be the change in distance. And let me get this out. The change in position over change in time. Delta S, delta T. It's a rate of change, ladies and gentlemen. And that's the velocity. Another definition. Well, I'm going to just make a remark. Let's say a note. Um, if V of T is positive, the particle is moving to the right. And you say, what do you mean? Well, we're saying here that if this rate is positive, the change in S, that means you're going to the right. You're going in the positive direction, whatever that is. And if it's a vertical line, that's also up. So I want to let you guys know. So you're talking this. Go back to that real number line we're looking at, right? Positive direction, negative direction. So this is a note. If V of T is negative, the particle is moving to the left. So we can have a, a negative velocity. That means you're going in the negative direction. And this is some information we have to know. And then finally, here's something extraordinary. What happens when you have zero velocity? Does anybody know? What's going on with the particle when you have zero velocity? What do you think is happening if your velocity is zero? You guys are quiet. Velocity zero. What do you think is happening? But you know, what do you think is happening with velocity zero, uh, zero here? Have you ever been in a car and you had zero velocity? The particle has stopped, ladies and gentlemen. Particle stop. So I have three notes to consider. Okay, one is when the particle is moving in to the right or the positive direction. Particle is moving to the left or negative direction. Here the particle has stopped. So we're going to try to do further analysis about this, you know, motion here of a particle along a line. We're going to try to find this kind of location. Here's my big question to you. Here's what we have to be concerned with. At what time t has the particle stopped? Now, the answer simply is when the velocity is 0. But you may say, Mr. Judge, don't I even have to have the velocity function first? Yes. And so you might say, how do I get this velocity function? Well, you differentiate your position function. And you say, well, what's a position function? I don't know. What is that? Let's go back. What is that? T. 
T cubed, something like this. Remember this here? T cubed minus 9T squared plus 15T plus 10. T cubed minus 9T squared plus 15T plus 10. And so D D T T cubed minus, I'm going to use properties of derivatives, ladies and gentlemen, because we studied those things, right? So notice this. Everything that I'm doing here is properties of derivatives. So by properties of derivatives, what's this? This is 3t squared, 2t, 1, and 0. 3t squared minus 9 times 2t plus 15, which gives me 3t squared minus 18t plus 15. So, ladies and gentlemen, I want you guys to know here, the velocity function is 3t squared minus 18t plus 15. This is very often what we look for. Velocity function. Okay? Now, you say, when is this particle stopped? When v of t equals 0. And you say, well, what does that mean? 3t squared minus 18t plus 15 has to be 0. You're going to have to solve for t. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's let this be the lesson of our life again, right? In calculus, what do we do? We essentially use algebra and arithmetic and geometry, right? So, it's... Everything that you guys had in the past, algebra, arithmetic, geometry, and soon we'll see trig, but you know, a lot of what we talk about is based on your past. Now, you do have to know definitions. This is my responsibility to teach you. What's a velocity function? It's right here. It's the derivative of the position function. So if you know that, then you say, okay, Mr. Judge taught me what the velocity function is, right? But the rest is algebra. Now, to solve a quadratic, you know, there's various ways. I actually prefer to use factoring. Um, but I have to take out the greatest common factor first, so we factor completely. So, all right, you go taking out the 3. Okay, it's kind of early. You guys know, okay, could divide both sides by 3, or I should say 3 times, you know, this actually implies I have this function here. All right. t squared minus 6t plus 5 is 0. Now you have to remember how to factor. And I do have videos on my webpage about factoring, ladies and gentlemen. Um, t minus 5, t minus 1. Let me double check. That looks good. And so here's what we're saying here. This means t minus 5 is 0. And it means t minus 1 is 0. So if I add 5 to both sides, you guys know that. We're solving a quadratic. More algebra, right? So we say t is 5. Add 1. Interesting. t is 1. So what this means here is, ladies and gentlemen, here's what this means. The particle has stopped. And you say, where is this particle stopped? When t equals 1 second and t equals 5 seconds. This is what we need to do. Okay, starting our world of rate of change, ladies and gentlemen. All right, so let's ask you guys a question here at this point, right? We found the velocity function. And we found the time, the time when the particle has stopped. T is 1, T is 5. OK, 
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, T is 1, T is 5. This is the time when the particle has stopped. Anybody have any questions on this? What do you guys think? Any questions? This isn't time for our questions. All right, what do you guys think about that? Any questions on this? What do you think? All right. Seems like you guys are okay. All right. Okay. Well, here's my next question here. At what time T is the particle moving to the right? and to the left. Now, this is a big deal, ladies and gentlemen. So go back here. I'm going to recap here. I know my position function, right? My position function is going to be what? Um, well, we got a position function. Okay, maybe I should copy this. Here's a position function. Here's my velocity function. Right, 3t squared minus 18t plus 15. And if I say to you, when does a particle move to the right and when does it move to the left? Right, you're going to go back to this criteria here. Go back to the notes that I gave you guys. Particle moves to the right when the velocity is positive. It moves to the left when the velocity is negative. And I just want to go back and adjust this note here, left or down, down if it's a vertical line, okay? So here's what this means. We're going to have to consider the velocity function. This is the setting right here. So I'll highlight that in red. We need to know what this is. We need to know when this is positive and when this is negative. That's when we need to know. And... I'm going to say to you guys, you might say, I've seen this question before. It's going to move to the right when the velocity, you said, Mr. Judge, was positive. It moves to the left when the velocity is actually negative. So you might say, when did I ever, let's ask you guys, when did you ever do these kinds of questions? Anybody want to tell me? When have you seen these questions? What do you think? Have you guys ever seen these questions? Ever, ever, ever. Have you guys seen them? This is what I'm talking about. Have you seen this kind of stuff? Where have you seen it? What do you guys think? Are you there? Do you log on and then take a nap? What are you guys doing? What do you think? When have you seen these kinds of things? Love you, sweetheart. Keep me posted. Text me about what you're doing and where you're at. Oh, okay, Esmeralda. Thank you. Thank you, Esmeralda. Okay, thank you. 
Thank you, Hayla. Yeah. Um, and let me remind you guys here. Here's the topic, okay? You should see this. This is this is really what's called. We have to use sign analysis, okay? Sign analysis. Yes, it's from algebra. And I'm going to go to my browser. Okay, so go to your browser, ladies and gentlemen, and I'm going to say to you, or go to my browser, go to your browser, go to your, who knows where you're at. Go, go to Math 125 in my, at my website, and I have this worksheets and videos here. So some of you guys may say it's under nonlinear inequalities, meaning linear, you know, these inequalities that are linear, they're simple linear inequalities. They're just variable x, right? You have x squared, x cubed, and rationals. Those are nonlinear. So if you click on this worksheet here, I have for like Math 125, I have all these nonlinear, um, you know, inequalities. This is what we're talking about. You see it in intermediate algebra. You should have seen it in pre-calculus. Okay, if you didn't see it, then get your money back. All right, you need to get some money back. So I recommend, if you said, I need to brush up on this stuff, Mr. Judge, well, here, go to my 125 website, Nonlinear Inequalities, and then you have Video Solutions. Now, the Video Solutions, I go over the solutions for how to you know, solve the odd numbered questions. One, three, five, seven, nine, blah, 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 right? Odd numbered. And this is about an hour and 42 minutes worth of videos reviewing sign analysis. Now, this is going to separate those who pass and those who don't. It's not just taking the derivative, ladies and gentlemen. It's like I said, this course is about algebra, and that's not my responsibility. I have to show you the calculus. So, you want to review the algebra, and like I'm like I'm showing you here, I go through the details of the odd numbered questions. It's a whole hour and forty two minutes, so I recommend hey go back and take a look, ladies and gentlemen. I recommend you guys uh, go review sign analysis. It's in my one twenty five, you know, um, you know portion of the website. But let me show you what you do here, right? You see. The first part of sign analysis, we actually already did. We found here, so so for sign analysis, if I go to this particular function, we want to do sign analysis on 3t squared minus 8t plus 15. You know, what you do here is you set it equal to 0 and you solve for t. And we said we did that. t is 1, and we get t is, what's after that? t is 1, and then t is 5. Okay. So that's really the first step in sign analysis, if you guys remember. And I, and I outlined that in my, my website. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is this. We take the real number line here, right? And this is, this is the function. This was velocity. On, and I do 0 here. t is 1 and t is 5. Now, at these locations, we notate that these are where the zeros are. Velocity is 0. So my velocity is zero. This partitions our real number line into three regions, if you guys remember. Sign analysis. So what you're going to do now is we need test points. You go, what do you mean? For every region, you need a test point. So if you see region one, you say, what is region one? Well, region one defines values here that are smaller than one. And you got to be careful because time, remember, be careful. Time here is greater than or equal to zero. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to pick a point clearly in region one, and I could use as a test point zero. And I want to test region one. You say, how do I test it? Plug in the value. Plug in, plug in the test point value into the function. So when t is zero, ladies and gentlemen, what do you notice? Three. This is three times zero squared minus 18 times 0 plus 15 and you might even say I'm going to recommend you actually don't I mean okay this one's simple when you have 0 you know the answer is 15 we don't care ladies and gentlemen about the value we only care about the sign so region 1 is positive that's my point 
Now, I want to remark here quickly. We already factored this. I recommend use the factored version. Where is it at? t minus 5, t minus 1. Using the factored version of this will make everything, your computations, faster and easier. Now, you might say that's 3 times negative 5 now times negative 1. Remember, we don't care about the value. We care about the sign. So negative times a negative is a positive. Region 1 is positive. We're doing sign analysis. And then you say, well, what about region 2? Right? Region 2 is right in here. Region 2, we pick a test point. And I'm going to pick a number between 1 and 5. I'm going to pick, um, oh, what am I going to pick? I'm going to pick maybe 2. That's clearly in region 2. So I replace t with 2. I get 3. 2 minus 5 is negative 3. 2 minus 1 is 1. So I don't care about the answer. I just care about the sign. So guess what? Region 2 is negative. Because positive times a negative times a positive is negative. Region, ladies and gentlemen, um, we got to need a color. I don't know. It doesn't matter, right? Give me a value in region 3, anything bigger than 5. We'll say, how about 7? Well, that's fine. Plug in 7 here as the test point, right? And here's what you end up getting here. If we plug in 7. 3 times 2 times 6. That's going to give you positive values. So let's really pay attention to these details, ladies and gentlemen. Because the answer to this question, and this is a heavy-duty question, and they're going to ask you these questions. When does the particle move to the right? Well, that's when my velocity is positive. When does it move to the left? It's when the velocity is negative. So how you really answer this question is take a good look at your sign analysis, ladies and gentlemen. And I just say to you, you know, in some ways, a big part of what you do in this course is taking derivatives and using sign analysis. We're going to see this theme over and over. So it's a good thing for you to review sign analysis, ladies and gentlemen. We just have to figure out how to answer this question. So you're going to go to the right, and here we have to answer. You have to represent, you know, region 1 and region 3 because this is where the velocity, right? This is my velocity function is positive. So read the interval. Here's where the interval is. Take a close look. From 0 to 1, 5 to infinity. So let's be careful. 0 to 1, union, 5 to infinity. Now there's a parenthesis here. This is a bracket here because time is greater than or equal to zero, right? But around one, you must use a parenthesis. Does anybody know why? Why do you got to use a parenthesis around one? There's a very good reason. Do not put a bracket on one. Put a parenthesis. Does anybody know why? What is it? What's the reason? What happens at time is 1, ladies and gentlemen? When time is 1, my velocity is 0. The particle has stopped. Now, 0 is neutral. 0 is not positive. It's not negative. So you need a parenthesis around 1. And then you say, well, what about 5? Same thing. And why? Because at this time, right, it's 0. Yes. Yes, Patricia. Because a particle, because the velocity is zero, particle is stop. It's not even moving to the right or the left. But the definition of moving to the right is positive velocity. And zero is not positive. All right, good job, good job. So this is how you answer. And you know sometimes in the book they'll use you know they'll say zero less than or equal to t, maybe less than one, or 
uh, how do they do that, right? Or t is greater than 5, just so you guys know. Uh, i got to do a better t. And then if you move to the left here, we say, what about to the left? Region 2. Well, you say, well, where's, where's region 2? This is where you're going to the left because region 2 is negative. Well, that's going to be between 1 and 5. But again, you never include 1 and 5 because at 1 and 5, the particle is not even moving. It stopped. But more importantly, it's the zero numbers there that I'm referencing here. This is the thing that you want to reference here. This is why I put the zeros there for this velocity function. Because that's zero is not positive, it's not negative, zero is ne neutral. And you can see in books, you know, t being 1 and 5. But here is essentially, ladies and gentlemen, the information that they're requesting. They want to know when is this particle stopped? When is this particle moving to the right? When is this particle moving to the left? And so that kind of makes sense now because we're saying between 0 and 1, what you're doing is moving to the right, and the particle stops at 1 second and then goes to the left. So if I go back to the original graph here, this is what this really means, right? This particle at 1 second has actually stopped at 1 and has turned around. Okay, so I know that kind of drew that kind of ugly. Let me see if I can do it again. So from 0 to 1, particle's going to the right, positive direction. It stopped, and it's turned around. So I have to kind of graph this turnaround here. And it's turned around, and let's see, it's going to the left. You say, what is the time interval that goes to the left? It's going to go to the left up until 5 seconds. So from 1 second to 5 seconds, it's going to the left now. And so we're going all the way here past t is 4. So we have to find the position, whatever that position is. We don't even know. But at t is 5 now, right? What we're going to do is we're going to Go hit turn around because now it's going back in the other direction. You say, how do you know, Mr. Judge? Because of what we found here with sign analysis, right? The particle's moving in the positive direction from 5 to infinity. Or you can just look at the sign analysis. So here, in, in some ways, you can say it's moving to the right, moving to the left, moving to the right. So this is why we pay a lot of attention to the detail with this rate of change and movement, movement of a particle. So this is a very fundamental idea, ladies and gentlemen, the rate of change that I've introduced to you guys about particle movement, right, left, and so on. Um, I'm going to leave you with a, the last definition, OK? But anyway, we're going to start to look at some more of these kind of examples. They're beautiful and interesting. And they have to do with rates of change. And we're kind of graphing the motion of a particle along a line. And remember, what did Sir Isaac Newton do? Why did he invent calculus? He really invented calculus to explain planet motion, movement. This is the purpose of calculus, to explain movement around us, or change, ladies and gentlemen. Specifically, rate of change. So at, at t is 5, we are at some position. Maybe it's good to find that, right? We want to find, where, where are we at when t is 5? We're going to have to know. I'm going to go to the ti. I'm going to say 5 cubed. I'm kind of interested. I want to know the exact details. 9 times 5 squared plus, there's an, how would I have 15 there? Oh, uh, plus 15 times 5. Oh, yeah. Plus 10. We're at minus 15. So, okay, it's good to know. We want to be thorough, right? So this location is minus 15. 
So, you know, we do have an idea of motion here. This is why Sir Isaac Newton invented the idea of motion. And I'm going to leave you the last definition for the day, though, to consider this, right? Because velocity could be negative, velocity can be part, uh, positive. So, definition here, right? I'm going to say this. Um, speed is the absolute value of velocity. Okay? Speed is the absolute value of velocity. Um, we're going to ask you velocity and speed questions soon, tomorrow. And, um, you know, that's what's going on. Now, I talked a lot. I went through a lot of great detail for you guys. Hope you guys understand that. You would appreciate that. Okay. But tomorrow we'll look at more detailed velocity question, we can ask you, what's the velocity at five seconds? What's the velocity at two seconds? What's the velocity at eight seconds? In some cases, the answer is positive, and in some cases, the answer is negative. But if they ask you, hey, what's the speed at a particular time? Five seconds, two seconds, whatever. Take the absolute value. Because notice, when you drive a car, you're traveling at a certain speed. Your speedometer the word speedometer, it doesn't have negative values. It has only positive values and zero. So your speedometer, what that measures is the absolute value of velocity because velocity is positive or negative. Velocity includes additional information. It includes directional information. So when you look at this here, you go, yeah, I see your point. The particle is moving to the right and the left or up and down. You could do it vertically. Um, yeah, I see your point. It is moving in different directions. And, and the graph, if you look at the book, the kind of graph looks like this. Um, you know, I did do it. I did, I did it highlighted, but the graph looks like this. People do it this way. Apologize. And they put arrows to indicate direction, you know. So this is kind of graphing motion. And this is the beginning of, um, you know, some of the applications that we kind of deal with with calculus. So anyway, I'm taking your time. I'm going to say to you guys today, we're going to give you a little break. You're going to read section. Looks like three, four rates of change. Now, if you want homework, you can contact me in Canvas and email me. I can give you some questions to look at. But, you know, we're going to look at some more tomorrow. And um, I hope you guys enjoyed the lecture. I hope you guys enjoyed this information. And if you really need to brush up on sign analysis, hey, maybe we should make that your homework. Oh, nice. You're going to say, Mr. Judge, you're killing me. Well, no, I'm not. I'm saving you guys because you have to do it on a test, right? Should we have you guys just ask you guys, should we have you guys do sign analysis homework? Should we have you do sign analysis homework on math, my webpage? Math. 125 called non linear inequalities. What do you guys think? Hmm, I don't know. What do you guys think? Should we have you do that? Because we're going to have you read section 3.4. Anyway, I get too excited. We're out of time. And we will do some more of those things tomorrow. And I hope you guys have a great day. I hope you guys learned something important. I hope you guys put it all in perspective, right? Make sure this course is your priority if you want it to be a priority for you, right? So make sure it's a priority. Uh, you may want to review that sign analysis because it's going to be here for quite a while, all right? So... Print your name in the chat section so we can take attendance. And you guys have a wonderful day. And we'll see you tomorrow. And we'll look at some of these things in, uh, in greater detail. Okay? So take care. Print your name. We'll see you tomorrow.